Hello, happy Thursday. I kind of forgot it was Thursday and then I said I would do this, but it is, so here I am. Tonight I'm going to read to you my short story, Biological Clock. This was the um, first story I ever thought of with werewolves. And it just kind of came to me in a vision one day, a woman standing over her husband who she had just killed telling him, I told you I was a real bitch during my monthly. And that's really how the entire werewolf saga got its start. I wrote this story called Biological Clock, which uh, was originally published. This will be a funny story for you. Originally published in the March 1997 issue of Mausoleum Magazine, which I don't think is in existence anymore. But the funny thing is, I never actually got a copy of that magazine. Uh, the editor, who's still a friend of mine, she's actually on Facebook. At the time, she was going by the name Crow Ravenscar, but uh, her name on Facebook is Kelly Ganson. I'm going to tell Kelly hi. Anyway, she sent it. Apparently, it was lost in the mail, and as was the way with magazine or you know small press magazines back at the time, it was handmade and stapled and everything, so there weren't extra copies laying around. She couldn't just send me another one. It didn't exist. So I'm going to read it to you from its first publication in a little booklet form. I was really surprised that I found this just last week. This is the very first edition of Call to the Hunt. It's also the very first thing published by Moonhauer Press. At the time, I was in Ponca City, so it says that's where it was. The artwork on the cover and throughout is also by Kelly, and uh, she designed the first logo for Moon Hour Press. This came out in 2001. I actually put this little booklet together as a promotional thing, like, you know, hey, I'm already somebody. Here's a little booklet with samples of my work, and when I would submit my novel, Shara, to a publisher. Back in the day, we had to actually print it and mail it. I would include a little copy of this. So I'm sure that most of them that I made back in the day ended up in the trash. The way it goes, you know. So biological clock is on page 37. How many stories are in here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stories. There was a foreword by Paul Fry, who ran a Short Scary Tales publications. Which I think might still exist. Back in the day, he ran an online magazine. And I won some contest for best story there once a long time ago. I was a reporter at the Oklahoma when that happened. All right, need a drink. Oh, here we go. Biological clock. No, you can't come in, Shara said, her voice almost a plea. You can't. Shara, this has gone far enough. Brian McWaters pushed on the door, but not as hard as he could. Shara knew he still worried he would hurt her. She pushed back, determined to keep the barrier between her and her husband. Come on, Shara. I gave in when you refused to go to a doctor, and I called the midwife back and told her we didn't need her, but damn it, I'm coming in there. No. Suddenly, Shara pushed with all her might and forced the door completely closed. She threw the first bolt, then more slowly drew the last three into place. On the other side, her husband implored, then pounded, kicked, and finally cursed, but Shara did not open the door. Another pain ripped through her body, and Shara doubled over her hands clutching her swollen abdomen. A short, sharp cry escaped her clenched lips. Brian stopped cussing. Shara, please, he begged. No, she gasped. Thick black hair hung in her face and sweat dripped from her nose. Brian had said he loved the feel and color of her hair once. Will he ever say it again? There's things I didn't tell you, Brian. I'm older than you think. I'll be all right, and another pain 
sent her to her knees. And when it's over, we'll have to talk. Now go. I'll call you when it's over. I'll tell you when the baby's here. I'm not going anywhere, Brian answered stubbornly. Had she startled him? Cheryl was in too much pain to tell. She got to her feet and staggered across the small attic room she had been secretly preparing for the past few months. Slowly, she lowered herself onto the soft pallet of quilts. The pains came close and hard now. She struggled from her clothes and lay on her back, waiting. Poor Brian, Shira thought. Maybe I should have told him everything right from the beginning. I told you my monthlies were hell, she mumbled. Her mind drifted back to the early days of their relationship while her hands rested on her belly, feeling the lives within as they prepared to emerge into the world. The problem hadn't been so bad when they were dating. Her monthly or period or cycle or whatever only lasted three days. It could have been worse. It could have been worse, she knew. She knew of others who went a full week, sometimes more. She wouldn't let Brian anywhere around her when her monthly came. When it was time, she would make some excuse and run away, either to the mountains or to some dark, unloved part of the city where she was among cold-hearted strangers. Brian had learned to tolerate it, though he had never liked it. Cherry had taken it as a sign that he really loved her. Why else would a man want to be around his woman while she was on her period? If my monthlies only consisted of blood, cram blood cramps and a short temper. Then they had married, and Brian had been more reluctant to allow her to leave him when her time came. She had always found a way to get out of the house, out of the area where her husband could be in danger. Often she escaped only after a bitter argument. But she endured that, thinking only of what the consequences might be if she remained. When she returned, he would sulk, but they would eventually make up their differences, at least for a month. Then the monthly stopped coming, and Sharon knew she was pregnant. At first, she hadn't known what to do. They weren't ready for children. Brian didn't know enough about her. She had considered abortion, but her motherly instincts wouldn't allow it. And besides, the doctor would have learned her secret. Brian had discovered her pregnancy, as she knew he must, and he was thrilled. Will he be so happy when this day is over? They're not yours, she sobbed, her hands balled into fists and pushing on the hard floor under the quilts. She tightened her muscles, straining to eject the new life from her body. One tiny lump left her, and she let herself relax, waiting for the next pain and the next of her offspring. She didn't look at the first, not yet. These children weren't Brian's. Cheryl was sure of that. Her condition caused her to be very in tune with her biological clock. She hadn't told Brian. If it had been just another man, then maybe she could have confronted her husband, but not with the truth of what she had done. He would see for himself soon enough. Shara screamed as the second child squeezed from her loins, followed immediately by the third. Then it was finished. She lay still, exhausted and sweating, listening to their tiny, confused cries. Slowly, painfully, Shara curled her body around those of her children. They were beautiful, she thought, so like their father. She touched them, stroked them, whispered motherly words to them. Two sons and a daughter. Shara smiled. She began cleaning her babies. The taste was like nectar to her elated tongue. She pulled them close to let them nurse, idly wishing for a third breast, and then she slept. Cheryl woke an hour later. Brian was knocking on the door again. He was begging to be let in. He sounded near tears. Cheryl checked her children and saw that they were asleep. She rose and hurried to the door. Just a minute, she called out softly. They're asleep. Let me get cleaned up. Brian was quiet. Cheryl hurried to the wash basin she had prepared and quickly scrubbed the dried blood and afterbirth from her thighs, crotch, and breasts then dressed in a long, loose gown of white satin. She went to the door and released the bolts that held it closed. Brian rushed into the room, glanced hurriedly at her, then turned his attention to the pallet on the floor, to the babies lying there in peaceful slumber. He seemed suddenly frozen. Shara moved behind him and put a hand on his shoulder. I have to tell you something, she whispered. First, they'll learn to control their shape. The teeth, the contours of the head, even the hair can be shed and regrown at will once they learn control, except during their monthlies. They'll have to give in to their other half then. Now you understand why I have to go away once a month. 
Brian remained statue still. I'm sorry, Brian, Shara offered. It was during my last period. I was in the mountains and I was running with a pack. The alpha male wanted me, and who was I, a stray bitch with a strange scent, to refuse the leader? It was wrong of me, I know, and I regretted letting it, ha letting it happen. But Brian, they're still half me. Isn't that good enough? They're animals. His voice was low, choked, scared. He finally turned his eyes back to her. What the hell are you? Why me? Then he turned and ran from the room. Shara slumped to the floor, crying. She had loved her husband so much until this very moment. And now... She knew it was over. She could hear him moving around in the room below her. He was in the closet. Was he packing? His own clothes or hers? Then Shara heard a sharp, familiar noise that brought her head up and stopped her tears. Brian was coming back up the stairs, and he was running. Shara sprang to her feet and rushed at the door, trying to close it and get the bolts into place before Brian got to the top of the steps. She didn't make it. The door was flung aside, and Shara slammed into the wall. She sank to the floor, barely aware of the scream rising in her throat. Brian stood in the doorway, his shotgun in his hands, his eyes fixed on the squirming pups. They were awake now and crying for food. Shara watched him raise the gun. She felt her hands thicken and her jaw stretch. A roar filled the room and Brian turned to face her. The transformation was only half complete and Shara knew she was terribly vulnerable at this time, but her husband had to be stopped. She was still the size of a woman. She still stood on her hind legs. Her body itched as thick, glossy black hair sprouted from every pore. She saw the fear in Brian's eyes, and it enraged her. The white satin robe billowed like a banner as Shara pounced. She grabbed the shotgun that with hands that were somewhere between human and canine. Brian tried to pull the weapon away from her. They moved as if dancing for a moment. Their faces nearly touched, and Shara could scent the terror coming from the man in sickening waves. Shara only wanted to take the shotgun away from him. Brian wouldn't let go. The gun twisted around. Brian's finger caught in the trigger guard. The babies were frightened and calling for her. Shara jerked on the gun. The room filled with thunder and the smell of smoke and fresh blood. Brian staggered away from her, his hands now free of the gun. His stomach splattered on the wall behind him. He turned surprised, pain-filled eyes on her, then fell dead at Shara's feet. Shara dropped the gun and returned to her children. Her shape shifted, and she was once again a woman, the widow of the man on the floor. She gathered her whimpering offspring into her arms and stepped over Brian's corpse, pausing in the doorway. We'll go back to the mountains, she whispered to her young. I'll teach you everything you need to know. Maybe we'll find Ulrich. We may need him. She sighed. We'll have a good life. As she looked at the body of her husband, I'm sorry, Brian, she said. I should have told you everything right from the start. I'll always try to think of you for what you were and not what you became. It's partly my fault. Maybe you wouldn't have reacted that way if I had told you everything. A last tear fell from her eye onto the head of one of the pups. Goodbye. Sherry closed the door on her husband and the life they had shared. So that's it. That's the story that started the werewolf saga, which, you know, is technically six books right now. If you count the one I just republished under a different name. Um, that story, Biological Clock, and all of those I read from the table of contents, plus a few others, are in the newer updated edition of Call to the Hunt, available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. I hope you'll check it out. Maybe write a review of it after you read it. Thank you for watching.